Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate, or you can go to buy me a cup of coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by, with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you, and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20 plus, you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you to Diane, who bought me five cups of coffee through buymeacupofcoffee.com. And because of that, this episode is sponsored by her. Thanks, Diane. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G. B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, CanadaEHX.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. Located in the southern interior of British Columbia, the landscape and bountiful resources of future Lumbee attracted indigenous groups who would move through the area and settle from time to time. Various indigenous groups would have territory in the area, including the Okanagan, and it's believed the indigenous occupied the area for upwards of 10,000 years, with the territory that stretched from the southern interior of British Columbia into Montana. According to the oral histories, the nearby Shushwap Falls were created by Coyote so that he could invite all of his friends to gather at the falls to feast on fish and celebrate the bounty that the land had to offer. The history of Lumbee as we know it today begins in 1862 when Louis Christian arrived looking for land. He would eventually decide to try his hand at finding gold, which he did at Cherry Creek. During the gold rush, the indigenous were able to maintain control of their territory in the region despite some minor conflicts with miners who came through the territory. Unfortunately, the indigenous were reduced in numbers due to diseases spread by Europeans, and with so many prospectors coming into the region, they would eventually push the indigenous off their lands, scattering them throughout the region. As for Christian, he would decide to find a wife, but to do so he had to go back to his home province of Quebec. It was there he married Selina Quenelle in 1874, and then returned to the area. The various gold miners in the area also fell in love with the landscape and decided to stay as well. One of the first men to bushwhack in the area was Donald McIntyre, who was said to have exclaimed in his Gaelic tongue when he saw the area, quote, this truly is the mountain of peace, end quote. The first man to preempt land in the district was Pierre Bassett, who acquired 320 acres in 1880. His land was located next to where Lumbee would eventually be found. Remembered as a generous man who was well-liked, his impact is still felt today thanks to lilac seeds. After taking a trip to his old home in Quebec, he brought back lilac seeds, and many of the lilac bushes in Lumbee today stem from those original seeds. At first, the name Lumbee didn't exist. Instead, it was called Bull Meadows because of the large number of moose in the area. The name White Valley was also used on various documents when homesteaders went to file for land. In 1892, Louis Moran bought 40 acres of land and he laid out the new town site which would become Lumbee. At the time, the name was White City, but that would soon change, and the first store would be built by Harry Sneed and moved into the community on stump pullers. The name would come from Moses Lumbee. Lumbee had been a government agent in the area and the vice president of the Shushwap and Okanagan Railway. He was a campaigner to extend the railway through the region, which was vital to the growth of the new community. After his death at the age of 51 in 1893 from typhoid fever, the community's name was changed to honour him. 
In 1892, a $7,500 hotel, no small amount for that time, was built in the community and named the Ramshorn Hotel. The hotel would open in January 1893 with 175 guests from across the region attending. The first hotel in Lumby had a short life, though. In late 1893, it would burn to the ground. Two years later, a new Ramshorn Hotel was built. The gold rush had dried up some years earlier, but for Lumby, a new industry would take hold and become the driving force of economic growth, forestry. The first sawmill was built in the area by Paul Passet in the 1890s and was powered by a large water wheel. His sawmill would cut the railroad ties as the railroad was built through the area in the coming years. In 1910, the first bank, the Royal Crown, would open its doors. In that first year, the bank would also go through a bit of excitement. A Mr. Murchison was in charge of the bank and he lived on the premises as well. Late one night, Milo Roberts came to the bank and demanded the doors be opened. Murchison refused and Roberts shot through the door. One of the bullets went through the hand of Murchison and into his chest. Mac Moreland, who lived nearby, heard the commotion and ran for help. Several men were sworn in as deputies by Tom Norris, the Justice of the Peace, to find Roberts. They searched the Ramshorn Hotel, and the deputies would arrest several loggers who were illegally possessing weapons, including one sleeping with his shotgun. Soon after, Roberts was found in bed fully dressed, and he was arrested, found guilty, and sentenced to spend some time in prison. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. While Lumby, the man, not the town, had campaigned for a railway through the area, that would not happen right away. The railway line to Lumby would be laid out in 1919, but it was not until 1925 that it was finally built through. With the arrival of the railway, the small sawmills that operated locally could now expand and ship out to markets across the country. As the sawmills expanded, the population began to grow. And for a time in the mid part of the 20th century, Lumby produced more timber at its sawmills than the combined output of Kamloops and Kelowna. In 1945, Japan let loose about 7,000 balloons across the Pacific Ocean. Each of these balloons carried a bomb, and that plan was the bombs would descend on North America, start fires, and cause panic in the United States and Canada. The Fugo Balloon Bomb, as it was called, was designed to be a cheap bomb, and it was the first ever weapon possessing intercontinental range. But the bombs did not have the desired impact that the Japanese had hoped. Only 300 made their way to North America, and only six people died from one incident, with little damage outside of that. Only a few reached Canada, going as far as Manitoba. But one of those bombs would land near Lumbee, but it would not be found for 70 years. On October 8, 2014, a Fugo bomb was found half-buried in the Monashi Mountains, near Lumbee by two forestry workers. It was far too dangerous to move the bomb, so they put C4 on either side of it and blew it up from a safe distance. This is likely the last remaining still live Fugo bomb in existence, and is currently one with the bombs removed on display at the Canadian War Museum. In 1949, Lumby decided to start to take the steps towards incorporation. It would organize a proper fire department and move its telephone system to a dial system. At the time, the community had 1,500 people, and the upgrade to the phone system was no small matter, costing $35,000 or about $420,000 today. 
For a village, that was a fortune, but the community made it happen. The first call with the new system was made between Board of Trade President J. Fred Fisher and Ross Pierce, the president of the company in Vancouver. The second call was made between Magistrate Hugh Catt to Rose Kahn, who was the original operator of the Lumbee phones when they first installed in 1908. By the late 1950s, residents of Lumbee were beginning to complain about the poor radio reception in the community. The Board of Trade would protest to the Department of Transport and to several radio stations in the hopes of getting it resolved. The first request was sent in June of 1957, stating that residents were dealing with a constant buzzing sound when trying to listen to shows on the radio. It was unknown what caused the issue, but it would happen throughout the day and night. A complaint was then sent to Ottawa. A radio inspector was sent out, and for a few days the radio reception improved, but it soon fell back to the buzzing sound that annoyed residents. By October, the Lumbee District Board of Trade was again asking for the Department of Transport to clear up the radio interference, which was being blamed on power lines. Letters were sent to the BC Power Commission, MLA Hugh Shantz, Lumbee City Council, and the Department of Transport. And in the end, the problem just seemed to go away, with the mystery never really being solved. As other communities in the area were getting televisions installed in their homes, Lumbee residents were hesitant to do so because of that poor radio reception. In 2016, the hockey spirit of Lumbee was broadcast across the country when the village won the Kraft Hockeyville competition. Not only did the community receive $100,000 to fix up its local rink, but it also brought the Edmonton Oilers and Los Angeles Kings to the community for a preseason game. It's time once again for us to recognize the incredible Kraft Hockeyville program. Communities across Canada have had the opportunity to show their extraordinary passion for the NHL and the game of hockey. This year, there were over 3,000 entries in the competition. Millions and millions of votes decided the winner for 2016. Congratulations to every community participating and supporting our great game from coast to coast across Canada. Now, special congratulations are in order for our two top communities, our finalists, this is the 10th year we will crown a champion, and either Lumbee, British Columbia, or St. Isidore, Quebec, will take that honor. So let's crown the Kraft Hockeyville champion for 2016. Congratulations to the winning community, Lumbee, British Columbia. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Lumbee, then take a trip over to the Lumbee Museum. This museum catalogs the history of the community dating back to the Gold Rush days. Within the museum, there are hundreds of artifacts as well as the Lumbee fire truck dating back to the early 20th century. The museum itself is located in the original Shushwap Falls School Building, which was built in 1903. In 1928, the school became the first in the province to have electric lights. And after its time as a school, it briefly had life as a chicken house on the Stevenson family farm. In 1955, it was moved into Lumbee, where it became the Youth Centre. Almost four decades later, in 1993, the building became the Lumbee District Museum, and in 2021, the building was expanded so it could provide a meeting place for the community. Since 1998, Lumbee has also held Lumbee Days as a celebration of the community. Themes have included Wheels of Diversity, Skateboard Action, BC 150 Year Celebration, Our Forests and Flower Power, and if you decide to visit Lumbee, and visiting during Lumbee Days is the perfect opportunity to experience all that this community has to offer. Throughout Lumbee, you will find murals that highlight the history of the community as well. These murals include Moses Lumbee, for whom the village is named, how the village appeared in 1914, and many of the first citizens of the community. On a beautiful summer day, it's a great way to explore the community's history through these beautiful murals on a walk through the community. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Lumbee, British Columbia. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to Canada 
ehx.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.